Welcome into UGA Football Live with J.C. Shelton, where the dogs come to talk. We are live. UGA Football Live, live. Round three. Arthur Lynch joining me. Um, best tight end in college football history. Y'all didn't know. He's got a, yeah, he's got, yeah. He's got great swag. Always comes in. Look at him. Nike sponsored. AirPods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. How you the doing? Goat, the goat for sure. The goat for sure. Uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. I mean, we, we were talking a little bit offline, but you know, these Saturday is like the one we just witnessed, just from from a pure college football fandom perspective. You can't beat it, man. For week two, that was awesome. No, exactly. That, I, I, that was I, awesome. I love the lineup, and we'll get into let's get into our uh, our Georgia takeaways. Real quick first, and we'll hit some college football stuff because it was a great week. Like we talked about, a great week of ball. Uh, really, week two was. Um, so, initial takeaways, I guess I'll throw it to myself here. Georgia yeah. came out, obviously, I think sluggish in the first quarter again. Um, and just statistically, I think Georgia has seven points, 132 yards um, off the top of my dome here that I wrote earlier today, and zero opponent turnovers in the first quarter. Quarter quarters second through the fourth through two games, six hundred no eight hundred something yards, uh, eighty nine points I think it was four turnovers by the defense by the Georgia defense. I think that's really telling. You know, I mean FCS opponents, but it, it did happen again here. Um, there was I mean Ball State is a MAC, but lower opponents here and Georgia still starts off sluggish. I don't know what that is. Um, obviously you can you can mention the the injury. At starters for multiple positions, um, that might be an issue there for Georgia down the road if they can't get them back. I don't know. Um, it could be just you know, vanilla offenses. You don't know. I think Georgia was really trying to prove that they could run the ball in this game. Um, didn't really work out that way. I, I, I do I do what I – I love what we saw from Dylan Bell at running back. Um, I think the injuries, and Kirby Smart mentioned this after the game, the injuries at running back, you know, it really prompted them to play Dylan Bell, who had been practicing there at times – during the fall, um, when Georgia had more of those injuries, when, when Kendall Milton was down and not practicing, Dejon as well. Now they've both been practicing a little bit. But still, with the injuries there, Dylan Bell comes in, and he looked like the most explosive running back that we've seen in two games, which is the craziest thing. And, you know, he's six foot, 200 pounds. But I, I remember last year just thinking, watching him as a freshman, that he was breaking so many tackles. He was so good after the catch as a freshman. And Georgia was more loaded at receiver. You had the A.D. Mitchell there. Lab McConkey was, was going off, and he was healthy. And, and Dylan Bell moves over there to running back and gets that, what, it was like 24-yard score uh, with a great cut outside. We haven't seen a lot of those cuts. It's more, I think, from a running back position with Roderick Robinson and Kendall Milton, limited snaps for, for Kendall for sure through the first two games. Um, also, Andrew Paul. And I think these guys are more of a downhill runner. They're gonna they're gonna hit the hole hard and they're gonna run through tackles maybe for a couple of yards. They get up the outside, they're looking to run somebody over. But Dylan Bell was like, no, I'm not gonna get touched. I love seeing that. Will we see that more? Um, I think they're gonna get him involved in a lot because they even get brought Bowers a rushing um a rush. They're gonna give Dylan Bell, I think, some more touches in that backfield like that this year. And I'd love to see it. So interested to see what that what, what happens with Dylan Bell at running back this week. Um defensively. The defensive backs were just flying all over the field. I mean, you look at Ball State, they were trying to get the ball out soon, and Georgia was still making them pay in the back end for that. Um, you know, the defensive line, I think, played better in this game, um, statistically-wise as well. Warren Brinson was in the backfield all day. Michael Williams, they were moving him from defensive end over to interior defensive line to get him one-on-one -on -one with offensive guards. I like to see that. That's very interesting. I think he's he's a true freshman All-American. He's so talented do other things with him. You know, I think he is the best Georgia defensive lineman. Use him in, in, in different ways. Get him one-on-one because -on -one people want to try to key on him. Love to see that. We saw Smile Mondon get a lot more snaps this week. You know, he was questionable with that foot injury. He only played a few snaps in week one. So, um, I, I, overall, I like what I saw. I think we played much better. Um, I think we opened up the playbook at times a little bit more um, to get Carson Beck and this team ready for SEC play. So, I'm really excited for SEC play. And right to see what Bobo does with this offense. Um, Artie, I'll throw it to you. Mm -hmm. Takeaways for Ball State, your first thoughts, maybe offense, defense. Yeah, I mean, I, I 
would somewhat disagree with, you know, we started sluggish. Obviously, it's, you know, I think we had like 21 points in the first half or first quarter. I mean, it, we, but I think, I think first half. Uh, yeah. From my understanding, right? I, I'm not in the locker room. Um, I haven't played in a long time. But it's just incredibly difficult. These, the, the, there are so many guys on this team that have played in big time games for the past two, three years. That I'm not saying that they like. I think Kirby does a really good job of staying present and keeping his guys locked in for the task at hand and not looking ahead. But I think. You know, all things considered, I think they played you know a very much complete game. I think they came out, yeah, it was a little sluggish, but you know they weren't in a dogfight in the first half, right? I mean, it was it was clear early on that this was going to be a blowout. Um, I think it, they looked much better collectively, both um, in all three phases of the game. Uh, I think they looked better um, than they did in the first game, right? And yeah. w- what did we talk about last week, right? We want to see improvement mm-hmm. from week one to week two, particularly at the quarterback position, particularly at the other positions that may not have the depth or the experience as say the offensive line or the defensive unit, right? The receivers, um, the running backs, uh, and, and obviously the guy under center. And I, and I think we saw improvement um, in those three offensive groups, right? Uh, in those skill position groups. And I think that's very important. Um, so, yeah, I, I Again, not worried. I am intrigued by this week, right? Um, and we can talk more about this game later. But as you know, as we all know, and anyone listening or watching the show right now, SEC play is SEC play, right? I don't care who the opponent is. I don't care how many five stars we have and how many a few five stars or four stars they have. Like SEC teams – have NFL talent. You know, Vanderbilt, understandably, does not have as much of talent, but the other 15 teams, I don't, you pick a team, there's NFL talent on that team. And I think this will be a good test for Georgia. We're playing away. Um, but I think if you're just looking holistically two games in, um, you have to be, you have to be excited about the week one for, to week two improvement. Because ultimately, that's you want to get incrementally better as the season goes on, and I think the coaching staff is doing a good job of um, what does Kirby always say: keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah. And I think the main thing at Georgia is compete and do what you can to do your job at a high level and get better at your craft every single day. And I think right now the team's getting better in perfecting their craft every single day. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm very much in, still in the relax mindset. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think sure. there's definitely things to key off. That's why I do mention some some things I'd like to see improvements on and some areas that I noticed that we were lacking a bit. You know, pass blocking receiver, I think it's one thing. But, again, you you don't have Lad McConkey in there. Marcus, Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, his first game back from the suspension. Um, so I think you get those young guys involved and more in a blocking mindset at times. And they're just learning. They're getting real game reps against people they haven't gone up against in practice. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is going to be, I think, a, a great game for these starters that they're going to be in there for longer. Now, depending on what the score is, you know, maybe late in the third quarter, fourth, maybe they'll sit. But, you know, it's not going to be like those first two games, I don't think. I don't think there's going to be much as, as no, much no, no, rotation no. on the defense. Defensive line and linebacker, there always has been. So expect that. But at DB – safety i know javon bullard probably going to miss this game which is a big hit uh but i think you have your front seven the rest of your defense those guys are gonna be ready to play i don't think that's gonna hurt us um but it is going to give an opportunity for other guys to, other guys to shine prove themselves can they play really well and show they can be a rotational player more um, but i think it is exciting for these starters to really get to play more in this game um yeah totally agree you know it, as far as let's, let's jump into running backs two more here because i uh I wrote a story on what Noshawn Marino said when he joined the Players' Lounge this week. Very mm-hmm. interesting to me. I totally agree with what he said. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, but basically, in, in other words, he said, you know, these running backs in this room right now should be angry. They should be angry that a receiver came in and took their reps. 
and only took the Rev played well, you know, and mm-hmm. he did something differently than we've seen and score a long touchdown as a running back and make a great cut, make a guy miss. There hasn't been a lot of that. So Doshan was like, it should light a fire under this running back room. So that might even be a benefit other than just on the field. It might be a benefit for that running back room and, and seeing a receiver come in and take your snaps. You don't want to give up snaps, right? I mean, that's not a yeah. thing that these guys do. They play at a high level at the highest level of college football. That's not what they're about. They want to go and prove themselves for a shot at the NFL, right? I thought that was yeah. interesting. I'm interested on in your thoughts on it too. Yeah, I, I think first off, you, you have to know uh, – you, you have to understand – to understand the quote, you have to understand the man. And now I didn't play with Noshawn in college, but I played with Noshawn with Miami Dolphins my rookie year. I got to know Noshawn very well. He became a close friend and someone I looked up to and trusted. We He tore his ACL and I broke my L405 vertebrae our, well, our, my rookie year. And obviously he was six or seventh year free agent signing for the Dolphins. So I got to know him really well. That guy is one of the most passionate dudes i know particularly when they strap on the helmet right like he tore his acl in the chargers game he had a, like a career game for us tore his acl like fourth quarter went in and was like pass block and, and like you know getting after it with a torn acl right in, in the nfl like this dude is he is balls to the wall competing at a high level and like is ready to go to the mats for his teammates, right? So when he, I, again, we're all the guys, like I'm, I'm washed up. No Sean's washed. We're all washed. But if No Sean Moreno, who is an all time great Georgia back, I think he's kind of like an icon, legend, personally, in, in terms of like, you know, Georgia history, he's calling them out. And, I, you know, I know they probably say, oh, who's this old guy or whatever. Like, no Sean, for No Sean to say that, He's taking it personal, right? Because he takes pride in being a Georgia running back. I know that for a fact because my rookie year, he and I were talking about it. He was like, what's Gurley like? What's Marshall like? Like, he goes, I like watching them play because they play with a passion. Like, they represent what it means to be a running back at the University of Georgia. And we don't have to go through the whole long list. We can. We can dedicate a whole three-episode series on the Georgia running back history and the guys that have come through. But Oshon's saying that because he's like, the fact that a receiver's coming in there and meeting the expectations and meeting the moment, and he's not even technically in your running back room, like that should really light a fire under you know the rear ends of those guys. And to to be clear, right? I think it's I think it's very clear um, about the type of program that Kirby runs and the and, and the type of program that that his coaching staff really tries to uh, or culture they really try to create and that's hey the best players will play and the guys that are willing to compete on a day in day out basis and do the little things right are going to play and if bell's the guy that's going to come up and be the starting running back and the premier home run guy yeah it's going to look weird because i think it's 87 right and he's toting that thing for the backfield yeah it might look a little weird they might have to go get him like number 23 or something but <laughs> man uh yeah, I saw the clip of that. I didn't watch the whole interview, but I watched the clip. I think it was rolling around on, on, on Twitter or something. And no, Sean, you could just tell, like, you know, he's not he's, – tears not coming down his face during the anthem like he did when he played the Broncos, but you can you can sense the fire in him, and, and, and it's personal for him. And to be honest, it should be personal for those guys who's who are not getting the reps. Yeah, no, I, I think the passion is evident, especially, you know, writing evident. the story, listening to him talk – with Aaron for like 30 minutes, definitely passionate. And he's on Talk. he's on every week for an offensive breakdown with Aaron and Ben Jones, Travaris King. TK, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So check it yeah, out there, sure. guys. Um, and I also do a write-up on that if you want to check it out. You don't have time to watch a video. But um, that's that's one of those things that was interesting to me is, is the running back situation. But you move on from that. Um, really excited to see SEC play. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Uh, let's talk college football weekend really quick. Let's do it. Right, we'll get into the history class with Arthur Lynch, uh, head of this South Carolina matchup. Matchup. Uh, uh, let's just start with with the creme de la creme, Alabama Texas. What a game, man! The environment you could, that's that's the first real college football game we've seen this year in two weeks, and well, week zero we counted three. 
the environment, the hype, and then play on the field because it went back and forth, low scoring game. Felt like one of those, you know, mid mid two thousands, uh, you know, late two like early two thousand ten SEC games, field goals, um, defensive battle, and then it went touchdown, 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 touchdown in the second half right there, and the fourth I believe it was, and you know you had Jermaine Burton running open for Alabama, Ad Mitchell was all over the field. I love seeing that for AD, but I also hated it because of yeah. what he did for Georgia, knowing the talent that left. And I fully expected him to do that for Texas this year. Um, just, just hearing from him all year, well, really two years at Georgia. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to look at the Alabama team for sure because they were so limited in their play calling, it felt like, with, with Milrow. Um, and it didn't, it didn't feel like they – I, I watched a little bit of it again just to kind of confirm what I was thinking, but Tommy Reese, the OC, it didn't feel like he called the game for Milrow and really got the most out of him, which was surprising to me. It was more like deep shot, deep shot, deep shot's not there. Nothing's there. And then we're going to run the ball up the middle and get a yard and a half. I didn't really feel like they moved the pocket or created place for him to be able to use his legs. And that's what he, he's so dynamic. He still made plays, but I think they, I think they could have called that game a little better and, Credit the Texas defense. I think they played they play obviously played really well and stopping them in the fourth right there and the offense holding the ball for like seven minutes. It was, I think. That long drive really kept Alabama from getting the ball. So a great game. I think Texas, you know, I mean, they beat Alabama they, on the road in Bryant Denny. Right. So that has to be considered. Can they do it for a full season? Well, they, you know, they're still, I think, a younger team. Can they do it against somebody on the road? later in the season who you're supposed to beat. I think that's just, that's something we haven't seen from him. But as far as playing in a big situation and playing well, and Quinn Ewers, Quinn Ewers, his, the thing that stood out for me, for Quinn, is his release is an NFL release. That is a quick release. His arm angle, he's not over the top. Quick release. I don't know what the timing was. I know they timed the NFL guys. I bet we could look it up. But his release looks so quick to me. Alabama really didn't have a chance almost to rush them. And they weren't blitzing them at the end either. They knew they weren't going to get there. They were like, I'm going to drop in coverage and just hope we can plot, you know, block a lane for you. Because I feel like Quinn Ewers' release is, is so fast that it's very hard um, to really put pressure on him. So that was really impressed by that too and his poise and decision-making. What what were your thoughts on uh, the, the tide going down, Nick Saban walking, walking out of Bryant-Denny with a loss? Yeah, I think like you know, look, we break down the game, all that stuff. Eddie Mitchell, yeah, it's all great. But I think ultimately, like what I like to do is, is look at the bigger picture, right? Like, and 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 at one point during the game, it looked like the roles of the two programs were reversed, right? For so for so long, for so many years, we saw Alabama terrorize quarterbacks get four five six seven eight sacks a game right not from the beginning of their dynasty but really in the past let's call it like six five to six years Alabama's ability to really spread the ball around the field you know have two or three receivers that can really stretch a defense um that wasn't the case right that was more Texas this time around and when I kind of look at Alabama holistically, right, I, and I have a couple of guys that I know that I'm, I'm close friends with that I played with, Zach Mettenberger, Joe Cox, that are on the staff there. Um, and I think Joe is – I think both of those guys are going to be kind of, you know, fa- you know fast risers in the, in the college coaching world. Um, but if you look at the structure of Saban's staff, and I was listening to a couple analysts this past week, podcasts, and reading a few things about, like, what's going on in Alabama? Right. And if you look at Georgia's success, yeah, Kirby's an unbelievable recruiter, right? He's been able to build this thing from the ground up and just make us into a powerhouse. But if you look at Kirby's, the continuity and his staff, right, over the course, really the course, past three or four years, right? Munkin was around for a couple of years. Muschamp's been now, you know, on staff for a couple of years. Um, but He's been able to collectively build staffs and have them around for a couple of years. And I think one thing that Saban has been lacking is there's just no continuity in the staffs, right? And there's so much turnover and you can kind of see it because it seems that like they've like Tommy Reese was like a plug and play guy. And I, and I know Tommy a little bit 
he was a the Notre Dame quarterback when I was when I was in college. Yeah, I got, got rolled by coast. Alabama in the national championship. Yep. Yes, sir. He did. And I uh I, I got to know some of his teammates when I was training at IMG at, in the draft. And I think he's a, I think he's a really good coach. Um, but it just seemed like that was like a kind of last minute plug and play, right? Um, from, from a from a hiring perspective. And they were I just think that if you look back when they had some more continuity within their staffs at Alabama, particularly at the coordinator positions, whether it be McElwin, whether it be to roll to Kiffin, to roll to uh, Sarkeesian, like they would tailor the offense around their personnel, right? Remember when they had Sims, who, who like is a Georgia kid and then – Got moved to like way his term. Yeah, H-back. I think he's a senior when he was starting. Was it is it Blake Sims was his first name? I think I um, it was Blake, but it was definitely Sims, number six. And but like you, you know, they went from like I think it was AJ McCarron to Sims, and then next thing you know, like AJ McCarron threw like I think he was like 28 3, 28 touchdowns, three picks, and then they got but they always tailored the offense around the skill set of the guy under center. And to your point. Milro, I just think like I think if if I were the OC, and obviously I'm not, and, and I'm and I'm not going to be, but I'm just sitting here in, in my uh, you know armchair OC or quarterbacking. But I would just be like, go look up Lamar Jackson tapes, or you know, like old West Virginia Pat White, Steve Slate, and be like, how can we get the ball into our playmakers' hands where they're comfortable? And to to me, they were just. Quinn Ewers is probably going to be a top five pick. Milrow is not going to be a top five pure passer pick. And you can't go like, you can't go shot for shot with like Steph Curry, a three point, you know, shooter. You know what I mean? It's just not going to end well. So I'm with you. I think they looked a little, they they lacked an identity. Um, And it Mm -hmm. it certainly wasn't for lack of talent. I think it was for lack of just a core identity on the offensive side of the ball. And, you know, defensively, it's like when you're up against an offense like that, you need to have an offense to counter that with, and I don't think they did. No, I agree. I agree. Several other matchups here. Um, interesting to me, I mean, a lot of ranked teams really struggle, too. I mean, you look at Tennessee. We'll stick in the SEC and a former – or a future Georgia opponent. They struggled. They did struggle yeah, with Austin P. And I, I doing some work for them with the Players' Lounge and kind of read into that a little bit and did some did – some, overview of that game you know it's interesting to look at because that was that was the tougher opponent they played and Virginia I feel like Austin P might even beat Virginia but Austin P in that that Tennessee pass defense they were able to expose them a little bit and that's what we saw all last year when Georgia tore them up is that pass defense now they had some starters back this year who were who were bitten by injury last year they're all seniors in that secondary red shirt seniors a couple of them they've been there for a long time they don't have a lot of game experience though and i think that's i mean obviously time to grow here but that was interesting to me to see because you also have you know joe milton who's who's one of the strongest arms in college football and that's great to have him in that up tempo attack but if you have a defense we've seen that tennessee offense and that system just be beat with better teams better teams with a good offense and a better defense that's where tennessee finds its match so that's something to look at, I think, as Tennessee goes. And they have a matchup with Florida in Gainesville for a Florida team that has absolutely nothing to lose. I mean, nothing to lose in this game. Man, I mean, they, they're well, – yeah, that think, Utah loss, I, think, I, I mean, think, this is, I, this I think, is going to make their season if they upset Tennessee. I think Napier's – I think he's coaching for his job. I think oh, yeah. in, in, I think we can – I think we can – I think it's safe to say now, even though it's year two, Billy Napier is coaching for his job as is Jimbo Fisher. We can get to Jimbo in a sec. You know, I think Tennessee, um, I saw them play in person in in, in uh, Heupel's first year. Obviously watched the game last year on TV between – I still think they lack serious depth, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, we, we, we don't – this isn't a Tennessee podcast, so we don't have to go, like, litigate their – their uh, They're a future past, opponent. Yeah, their past – 10 years of the coaching carousel nonsense and, and the guy that was there before Apple, but I think they lacked a serious ability to like develop talent. I think they were okay at recruiting obviously, but they just like, even last year I was like, yeah, they're good. And they got some players, but 
I just think that like, you know, they, if they lose a guy here or there, it, it you know, it's, it's kind of a house of cards type deal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you look at Georgia, you look at Alabama and even, you know, I can't really say Texas yet, but look at Georgia, Alabama, even LSU, like LSU last year, the year before last, like lost, I think they played that bowl game in Ed, in Ed Orgeons last year. And like, they had like 48 scholarship guy or something ridiculous. But the guys that they had left were still dudes. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. it's depth is the biggest issue anytime you're trying to build a sustainable like contender in the SEC. And I think Tennessee still probably lacks depth. I think they're probably ones across the board are solid. Maybe some cracks in the armor and the defense side of the ball, but I still think they lack a little bit of depth, which is where like, you know, the Alabamas, the Georgias, the LSUs typically are like, okay, yeah, like our guy's down, but we've developed the guy in this next man up mentality that he's going to be more than all right. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but that's kind of my view on Tennessee right now. Yeah. Watch that defense, y'all. I know we're playing them in the future. I mean, you got to keep up your SEC opponents here. Tennessee is one of course to watch and Joe Milton has a strong arm receiver core is not as good as last year. Running back room, actually good running back in room oh, yeah. is good. Their offensive line can push people off the ball, at least against lesser opponents. We'll see against Florida this week. Um, but that defense, yeah, I keep it on that defense. Um, we'll move into just a couple more. I'm going to get into uh, history class with Arthur Lynch here in a second. Um, mm-hmm. Auburn Good. struggled with Cal. Got away with a 14-10 to 10 win. I know Hugh Freeze is just trying to get that built up. We'll see what they can morph into. Wisconsin went down to Washington State. Wisconsin was number 19. Um, and then Oregon, Oregon covered the eight-point spread on a pick six. I like that. Um, Bo Nix on the road, though, so. He's not on the road. He's they're they're going to score eighty or something like that. And then North Carolina, <laughs> North Carolina went uh, and law and beat Appalachian State by six and two overtimes. That was a great game. Um, and we'll just for sake of time, we'll move on. I, oh, one one's Ole Miss. Ole Miss. I know they beat a backup quarterback from Tulane. Somebody to watch. I mentioned on this show in the past in the off season. Watch out for Ole Miss. Everybody's skipping over Ole Miss in this Georgia schedule this week. Georgia schedule. I'll mention. But something to look out for. And also, last thing, Utah, 20-13 to 13 at Baylor, though. But I don't think they're as good as we uh, thought they were. But they need their starting quarterback back. I think that'll be a different team. Something that one to watch. Ki- that one killed me, Coach. I was pulling for Baylor because my boy Chris Robinson is the coach over there. <laughs> and uh, they jumped up to an early lead, and I was like, oh, upset. Here we go. Here we go. And then – yeah, that one stunk for my boy, but it is what it is. <laughs> no, I play well. what it is. Defensive battle. Um, all right. Let's get into history class with Artie Lynch. He'll be doing this every week for you guys uh, because we love college football. We love the history, and that is part of college football is the history. So, Artie, take it away. What you got for us this week? Yeah, so obviously, I kind of want to spiel last week. Um, huge college football fan. I mean – I was like a college football almanac. I was like, uh, you know, it's like walking, talking encyclopedia as like a eight, nine, 10 year old. Right. Uh, but I'm going to keep it in the theme for Georgia. Last week we talked about the 2013 um, Georgia, South Carolina game. And then this is going to also on this day in history, September 14th, we're going to keep it the same South Carolina opponent who we're also playing Saturday. But this is an ode to the Georgia great, Georgia legend, three-time All-American uh, media darling, David Pollock. And it was the day 21 years ago, 2002, David Pollock had his signature that kind of stacked the quarterback, palm the ball, come up on it with the pick. And I got, yeah. I got a, a AP article and they asked coach Rick, uh, coach, what do you think of this game? Um, and coach Rick goes, one of my first observations is that David Pollock is a warrior. And, you know, again, did not grow up uh, a Georgia fan, but there are a few kind of like burning images that I have from like, CBS, you know, highlights over the years, right? When you're watching the game, whatever the game it is, and they would always play that David Pollock, like chasing down the quarterback end zone. It almost looked like a wrestling move where he just like 
grabbed it, comes over, picks the ball off. And, um, you know, I was doing the whole Google, looking up uh, Wikipedia about old schedules, Georgia, you know, September 14th, what year. And, and sure enough, 2002 pops up. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's the clip that I saw earlier the week circulating on the internet from David Pollock. So kept it Georgia again this week. It just ironically came, you know, South Carolina week, uh, two weeks in a row for, for our little this day in history. But um, as we kind of go through the season, I'm, I'm going to throw in a different, cur- a couple different curveballs, talk about a different moments in history that I think will be relevant um, to anybody that's a, a college football fan. But shout out to David Pollock a history major at university of Georgia, like your boy. And, um, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, he, obviously he's going to, he's landing on his feet from a media perspective, but what a guy, what a representative, what, a, what, a, what a kind of um, a spokesperson for the university, man. I think David's an awesome guy. Yeah. On that note, I mean, you know, I, so he joined the players lounge last week and the defensive breakdown, which we just mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, guys, check it out on TPL, the players lounge. Um, he joined Aaron, a couple of other guys. Can't remember. I think it was uh, Brandon Boykin, uh, somebody else. Um, and then he jumped in. They talked about the defensive takeaways from Week One, and it was interesting. David said that was the worst Georgia defensive line play that he's seen in a couple of years. Something consider of the teams that we had the last two years and defenses that you had and the guys on those teams. Yeah. But you know, he he ended it with you know they're going to get improved. But just something to think about. But I also hearing him speak during that, I was like, he is going to be on TV somewhere. He has to be. And me and my girl, we were talking about the other day, watching college game day. Um, we were like, they're, it's missing something. You know, Pat McAfee's in there now. I love Pat McAfee's energy. I think he's hilarious, but he doesn't have the football analytic mindset and or takes, or it's really informative additions into the talk that David had. And I do miss that a lot from college game day, but I'll still watch it anyway. It's for the vibes. It's for the energy. Okay. Yeah, I think I think David, and again, this, you know, sport, this is going to be an all inclusive college football podcast and our, our, our show. I think if you, if you look at the media landscape of, of what's happening over the course of the next like, you know, ten years, in in I think it's really a seven year deal. I think David, even though he's an SEC guy, I think CBS and Fox and NBC are going to make a play for him, and they obviously signed a massive deal with um the big 10 and um i you know i he he has such a strong brand and he's so good on tv that i think he'd be a really cool i think his personality fits the big 10 almost better than it does the sec just because the way he played defensive line and and the defensive linemen that are just kind of like mean psychopaths that have come through like you know the ohio states the penn states and the Michigans. And I just think that that fits his personality. And, and he, I think he'll provide s- some awesome. Insight. And I, I have no idea. I mean, I, me and I do not know David Pollock. David does not know me, but I just think that the amount of, the amount of the, the amount of coverage that the big 10 is going to get with that seven year, $7 billion three network deal that they just signed I think David hopefully will find a place over there because I think it's it's a big time loss on ESPN, and yeah. he's going to land on his feet. And whoever gets him is getting a stud. Oh, for sure. Um, change the music. That's all I want. I mean, I'll watch it. Change the freaking music. If you're CBS, I don't want to hear SEC's music. Okay, history class with Artie Lynch. That was great, man. We appreciate it. Um, let's get into South Carolina for real now. Let's talk about some stats and players to watch here. So things to know for South Carolina. When you watch this game, covered this game this week, did some research, of course, for that. And a couple of points I want to touch on. So first, Spencer Rattler is much improved. All right. So when Georgia Mm -hmm. faced Spencer last year, that was his third game in that uniform, obviously transferred from Oklahoma, a lot of hype. Um, He was still getting comfortable through for 118 yards, two interceptions, 13 to 25, I believe it was. Obviously horrible, right? Look at the Georgia defense. I mean, you know what he's facing. They were like the, one of the only teams to really do that to him last year. Look at the end of the season, played upset at the end of the season. It was – the game cost did. It was largely because of Spencer Rattler. Um, and this year, he's even taken a further step from an efficiency standpoint through the first two games, and that's against North Carolina 
and Furman. Um, obviously lost to North Carolina. It was a shootout for a bit. North Carolina pulled away. Um, Furman, they killed him 47, 17, something like that. Um, he is second in the SEC in passing yards at 698. He's first in the SEC in completions percentage, which is 83%. And that should tell you a couple of things. One, it tells you he's getting the ball out fast. Two, I think it tells you that the offense and the offensive line, I think game, the Gamecocks know what they have there, and they know they have to get it out fast. And they know they have to be more of a dink and dunk and get it out before the sticks and not take as many shots. Um, their offensive line might be one of the worst in the SEC, at least of how they've played to this point. Still early in the season, we know. But they're not playing us later in the season. They're playing us Saturday. So they've given up nine sacks all to North Carolina in that first game. Furman did get one, North Carolina nine sacks. They're ranked 129th out of 133 FBS teams in sacks allowed. Look at the run game. You know, you want to look at both ways. Maybe they're a good running team. Maybe pass protection is lacking. Not the case right now. Averaging 53 yards rushing. So they are very one-dimensional. Now they do use their running back out of the backfield and joiner. And he is he is one of those dual threat backs now. The running game hasn't been there for them. And of course, that translates to Joyner. But as a receiver, he is good. He can give you that dual threat. He's a do-it-all back. Um, I think that that's really where that team starts because they lost some guys. They do have some weapons on offense. We'll get into now. Defense averaging. Let me make sure I'm gonna tell you this right. I think it's 32 points a game they're giving up. Um that's Oh, not 32, 28, something like that. Sorry, boys and girls don't have it in front of me. Remembered all the other ones, though. Um, and something to look out for, I think, is that defense, it, they're going to want to pressure and, and show some new things to Carson Beck because they know this is going to be his third start. And I think that's really the only way they can take advantage. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to do on offense. I think it's a lot of that dink and dunk. They're going to try to keep doing that with Spencer Rattler. He's been efficient, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Um We'll see what he does this week against Georgia. Let's get into players to watch here. Here's my five key. We talked about Rattler. He's one of them. Um, at receiver, this dude's a dog. I mean, he Xavier Leggett, um, or Leggett, mm -hmm. however you pronounce it, 296 receiving yards through two games. Big part of that passing attack. It already surpassed his 167 yards all of last year, and he has three less receptions than he did all of last year. So he is that guy. He is that target for Rattler right now, and he's 6'3", 227. He's like Alshon Jeffrey we talked about last week. He's a matchup problem. So can they get him one-on-one -on -one with these Georgia defensive backs who have not been tested against big guys? That's one thing we have not played yet this year is bigger receivers who can challenge you mm -hmm. like that. And Arthur, as, as a route runner, you can talk on this all day, I'm sure. I'd love to get your input. But the 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 pose the threat that that poses on the outside for a guy like that who's physically going to overmatch your defensive backs we don't have anybody that big right our linebackers maybe outside outside linebackers but we don't have yeah. any guys like that how do you go about game planning for a guy like that on the outside yeah it's 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 really tough right I think when you think about receivers it you know, what makes receivers special, right? And, you know, Tyree Kill, he's got the burners, right? Like, you blink, he's 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 past you. But if you look at some of, like, the, the best receivers of the past, like, 10, 15 years, they've got great length. And what do I mean by that, right? I'm not saying they're, like, 6'6", Megatron, Calvin Johnson, but you're looking at, like, anywhere from, like, 6'1", to 6'3", and they're – their catch radius is huge, right? Long arms, ability to go up and get the ball. And, you know, I think Georgia has, in the past couple of years, have had some DBs who, who also had some great length. And yeah. that's very helpful when, obviously, when you're going up against a receiver who's big like that. But uh, you, you've got to be physical with them. You've got to be physical at the point of attack. And you've got to be able to – track the ball in the air because no matter how much length that you have as a defense, as a defensive back, right. you ain't going to be six, three two thirty, Right. I think mm -hmm. the only DB, I think there's two DBs who have been like six, one plus that I know that was Drake Kirkpatrick, who was a former first round pick for Alabama played 10 years in the league, 
Cincinnati Bengals guy. He was about six foot three. He was my year class. And Patrick Peterson is about six one. But yeah. typically, your prototypical DB is thin, decent length, but like thick, 5'11", six foot. Like you're not talking about a big, big guy, right? Physical, sure, no doubt. Extremely athletic, hundred percent. Like tier one athlete. Yeah. But when you got when you got to get like this, you got to match his physicality, and you got to be able to track the ball and. You know, you got to put pressure on the quarterback. And I know, I know that is not up to the DBs. That's up to the front yeah. seven. Yeah. And we talked to, we talked a little bit about it with, with uh, about what David Pollock was saying. You got to give your DBs a chance. Cause if, if you, if you give the quarterback all, you know, all the time in the world, the six foot three dude who could run, he's going to be able to make plays. So yeah. you got to get the quarterback. And uh, if you're just joining the stream, we were talking about Xavier. Leggett for South Carolina, 6'3", 227. He's their main pass catcher. Um, we're talking about the impact he could have. I, you know, Brandon Boykin was also on that call with David Pollock as well. Um, he was talking mm-hmm. about how the defensive line, you know, helps your defensive backs. Of course, we know that, you know, they, they can sack the quarterback, you know, present um, weird angles for that quarterback to throw at and mess up the route run um, and his, his throwing ability. I think something to think about here is the safety play for Georgia is so good right now, even without Javon yeah. Bullard out. Even without mm-hmm. Javon Bullard out, Dan Jackson and Daniel Sisavan playing really well right now. Tyke mm-hmm. Smith at star is playing like an All-American like he was at West Virginia. Um, so I think that safety play, that's why I'm not as concerned. And at least the corners that we have are physical. Yeah, oh, they yeah, might yeah. be thin or smaller, but they are physical. So just something to know, not something to be worried about per se. Um, but if he, he goes up for a jump ball, if they get in the red zone, look out for my man Xavier. Um and we already talked about the carry on joiner running back, do it all guys. Um, 23 times for 65 yards. We know South Carolina's run game is atrocious right now. But, you know, every team improves for a week to week, especially early in the season. Um, he's got nine catches for 66 yards. So that's where they like to use him. That's where his best average is. Watch him come out of the backfield. Maybe a maybe a, a challenge for our linebackers in coverage. Um, and then as far as defensive. Not a lot there for South Carolina. You haven't seen a guy really take off and be that number one, in my opinion. Um, I like Jalon Kilgrove. He's a Georgia native from Eatonton. Um, leads him in tackles, 18 stops on the year. Had 12 tackles versus North Carolina. Former four-star guy. And at linebacker, Debo Williams. Um, most productive player in that front seven. Junior, 18 tackles this season, 14 in the season over in North Carolina. Um I think this sets up for really a domination game for George on the offensive side of the ball. I think Bobo opens up the playbook. I think you have to. I know we have UAB next week, but then you go to Auburn and the fighting Hugh Freezes. And just like with Florida, I know, I know obviously Hugh, Hugh Freeze is not, well, he could be fighting for his, his job anyway, because it's Auburn, right? They have so such high expectations anyway. No, there is no telling. When it comes to Auburn. <laughs> yeah. What a dump, oh, dumpster fire most of the time. Um, the fighting Hugh freezes. We got to go face them in a couple of weeks, right? And interesting to think of them because it's at Auburn and they have so much to gain from even making it a close game, right? So I think I really, that's, we'll get into our, what we want to see now. We've kind of ran through things and we're looking good on time. So let's, let's talk about what we want to see. And I, I would love to see Bobo open up the playbook. I would love to see Carson Beck, who looked, by the way, so much more comfortable. I know that first drive was not great. You know, ended with a fumble that he recovered, ball in the wrong hand as a runner. I'm sure he got chewed up in the film room for that, which he should, but, you know, young guy as far as game snaps goes. Um, Peyton Woodring missed that kick. I feel like I jinxed Peyton Rudick, Woodring last week. I was talking about the kicker. You remember what I was talking about? I was like, we got a freshman yeah. kicker. He's starting. I jinxed him. I jinxed him a week out. I mean, that's, that's on fault. me, guys. That's on me, guys. I take the loss for that one. Um, just let me know your Venmos, and I'll send a, I'll send three points to you. Um, but I, I think that's what I love to see. Bobo open up the playbook. Carson Beck looks so much more comfortable last week. Does he keep that streak going? I think Georgia might get a couple guys back. It looks like Dejon Edwards is going to play um, from an injury standpoint. Lad McConkey doesn't seem like he's going to play. Been been not available, Kirby Smart said on Tuesday. And usually when you cannot practice uh, on this Kirby Smart squad, you do not play. That's what we've learned in the past. Um, defensively, Javon Bullard, we've already mentioned. 
Um, I, I think if you get Dejon Edwards back, get him in the pass game a little bit. Let's see what happens there. Um, I, I like Brock Bowers in this game to really match up on these South Carolina defenders in the back end. I don't think they can run with them. Not many people can run with Brock Bowers, but I think I think Georgia opens it up enough in the run game. Excited to see the run game. I think the run game makes its statement in this week because all they've heard the last two weeks is how bad they're playing. But they're not even really playing that bad. It's just not has it's not at the level. They're ranked ninth in the SEC and running right now. They were fourth. They finished fourth last year. A couple of new pieces on the offensive line, running backs, injuries. I like to see that get a little better this week. I think it does. Um, and that defense for South Carolina is going to have so much trouble, I think, with what Bobo and, and Carson Beck, Dejon Edwards, and um, Brock Bowers are able to do in this game. Um, and that offensive line gets gets more cohesion about it, a little bit of confidence maybe in, in the first, second quarter, and then it goes off and really really runs it up the throat. I think that's what I think that's what happens. I think that defense for Georgia, the defensive backs, maybe they play a little bit more in the game. Maybe they're excited about that, like we talked about earlier. Um, so I, I like I like Georgia a lot this week. It's at home. It's three thirty. What a beautiful game! It's on CBS. We get to hear the music for one of the last times on an SEC game. I'm going to be pumped for that. I'll be in Athens, so I guess I won't get to hear it per se. But love the CBS three thirty kickoff. All right, Smash. Kirby Smart has already challenged the fan base, right? Because uh, they had this they had this South Carolina offensive guard. You might have seen this already this week. Um, in SEC media days, he said that Georgia wasn't – well, he didn't necessarily say Georgia wasn't an intimidating atmosphere. He just mentioned Texas A&M and I think Neyland Stadium as the two places toughest for him. So Kirby Smart, of course, dropped his name in the conference. Well, that was on purpose. That is so on purpose, yeah. right? Like what? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. So he, he challenged the fans with that. So I, I expect really Kirby combination. knows how to Kirby knows how to, he's got like that, that Michael Jordan like psychosis thing going on. Like he'll just he'll he'll find a way to be like not jaded, but like slighted, even if there's like which is you know, that's how he motivates his guys. But yeah. um and they respond, I, you know, obviously. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Trust me, I think he knows how to get he knows how to control emotions and you know, poke the bears on his team that need to be poked. It, 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 proverbial bears, you know, obviously. And 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 I think he just knows how to get the guys going. And obviously they had a they were upset when they were number one in the country by South Carolina back in 2019, I believe was the game. He's I'm sure he's he's bringing that up. I have to be completely honest. I actually had like South Carolina as a potential dark horse to be like an eight, nine, 10 win team this year. Um, Cause I think Beamer can recruit. I think he has been recruiting. I think he's a motivator or was a motivator, but I gotta be honest. I hear a lot of, a lot of complaining from him. Um, and they haven't been playing very inspired football. Like I thought they were going to beat North Carolina, to be honest. Me too. I took them. And and that that was embarrassing in so many different mm-hmm. ways. And so I think they're about to get just manhandled on Saturday. Um, personally, I think Georgia, this is a this is a it's a test for sure. I'm glad it's home, to be honest, because William Bryce is a wild card. That is you want to talk about a tough place to play. Yeah. Um it's when they go sandstorm. It's you know it's a wild place. When we played there in 2012, we got our rear ends handed to us. Me and Aaron, they were playing Sandstorm. I think College Game Day was there. Top mm-hmm. five matchup. Don't bring I'm that up. Down the, I'm Don't bring that on up. Don't bring that up. Bench. Me and Murray are like, we get ready. We're getting the ball. Uh, they kick it off. They're, they're doing Sandstorm, and I'm like, I look at Murray, and I'm like, we better come back. We better come out firing because this is the loudest stadium. I have ever been in shaking the bench, the bench that we were sitting on were shaking. We don't have to go into the details of that game, but it did yeah, not go hurts. as planned. That absolutely. But hurts. I'm just, Party. so and I'm bringing that up. It doesn't even matter. We're playing at home, but I, I like yeah. us this week. Um, I think Spencer Rattler is going to be very, very sore at the end of the day. Um, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity for Carson Beck to like, my guess is we'll play a full game no matter what the score is, unless it's like a really, really, really bad blowout. You know what I mean? 
But I think, you know, it's going to be a really good opportunity to, to see an SEC defense, real SEC players. And it's going to be a different speed. I don't care, you know, how good this team is or good or, or bad this team is. SEC players are not the first two weeks that they, they just faced, right? And I think mm-hmm. it's going to be a great opportunity for the entire football team at UGA to come together, 3.30, CBS, the music that we love will be humming. And as for, as a former player, anyone will tell you, anybody, that the CBS 3.30 slot is the best slot in college football, right? The night games, the 12 games, there's pros and cons to all of them. But as like, there is no better feeling in the world then when you and your boys go out of 3.30, national televised game, SEC rival, home game, Sanford Stadium, between the hedges, like, you know, the, the sea of red, you go and win the game, and then you, you can go, you come after the game, you get the, you get the food, you go back to your home, hang with your family, can relax, can do that kind of like post-game tailgate and not feel like rushed and chaotic because it's like you can watch college football, it's not midnight after – there's just so many different factors that go into being a, a college football player, a student in Athens. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, look, I just know that how those guys appreciate and love those 330 slots because I know we did. And they're going to be up for this game. Um, yeah. And I think, I think they're going to wipe the floor of South Carolina. And obviously we can't overlook UAB, but – Auburn is definitely a game that that scares me more than South Carolina this year because it's at there. And I think Hugh Freeze is – he's a good coach. He's got tricks up his sleeve. And we'll worry about them in a couple of weeks. But, yeah, yeah I, I like I like Georgia. I like Georgia big this week. All right, let me give you a prediction. Tell me if we cover 27 and a half and then give me a score. I normally don't like those spreads to cover because it's just so many points. But – I don't think South Carolina is good this year. I don't. And um, three weeks ago, I would have said, no, it's going to be a dogfight. I think Georgia puts wins by 31. I think it's like a 42, 44 to like three game, right? Maybe 44, mm-hmm. 10, um, yeah. but they, they still cover. Yeah. You? Um, I, quick note about the 330. I heard Javon Bullard and Jackson Meeks, they also – do a show at the Players' Lounge. Check us out, guys. Um, they said as well, they echoed your point there, 330 games. They were like, man, that 330 game is different. So, different, man. This man knows what he's talking about, folks. Artie Lynch. Different. Um, that's, like a, that's, that's a timeless thing. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure you talk to, like, Stinchcomb and them, and, like, pop. they're going to say that 330 slot. And it's not to, like, go downtown and be – it's just, like, you get – there's there's so many few opportunities you get to suit it up between the hedges, right? And I know for me, especially like my grandfather coached football for 35 years, played college football. My, like my family would come down, and to be able to go and just chill after a 3:30 game in the house with like the Murrays, the Robinsons, the Frickses, it's like you know foods there. It's just like. And then, you know, the parents go like, all right, kids, we're going back to the hotel. And then we're like, all right, now we're going to be college kids at night. You know what I mean? It's just like, mm. it's such a cool atmosphere. And I'm biased. You're biased. There's no better place to go to college than the University of Georgia. But that 330 slot, it's different. It's, it's, it's going to be rocking, guys. We're really excited for it. Um, hope you are as well. Uh, for me, I think Georgia, I'm not going to get into what I said because I just said what I think is going to happen. But I will say, Spencer Rattler gets picked off at least once because that Georgia pass rush gets to him a couple of times. Um, Georgia, the cover 27 and a half. I like as 48-10. I'm going to give him 10 because mm-hmm. I like the over of 54. Okay. Right, boys and girls. All right. And uh, one thing I'll leave you guys with, a couple of picks for you to look out for. Mississippi State is plus nine and a half over LSU. Oh, I like Mississippi, Mississippi State. State. I like <laughs> Mississippi State. Me and Artie both like Mississippi State. Will yeah. Rogers, Arnett, great defense. Not great defense. Good defense. They're going to cover nine and a half. Tennessee, minus six and a half over Florida. I think Tennessee makes a statement here. Florida's just abysmal. I, I don't think they do enough here. They don't have enough. I think Tennessee pulls away at the end. They cover seven and they cover six and a half. It's just a touchdown. 
Arkansas, minus seven and a half over BYU. Arkansas is playing good. They can run the ball. They're leading the SEC in running. BYU does not have the dudes up front to, to beat a Sam Pittman-led, K.J. Jefferson-led Arkansas offense and offensive front. Not going to happen. Seven and a half. And then already my Georgia picks have been noted. We appreciate it so much, guys, for you listening and watching. We'll, of course, have this episode up on our YouTube as well going into the weekend. So I'll be pushing this tomorrow and leading up to game day. So if you want to jump in and watch it, we appreciate it. Subscribe to Pulse Sports Network. Um, I'm also going to load this up into the UGA Football Live podcast on audio platforms. So please rate us there and give us a follow. As always, Arthur Lynch has been great, man. Can't wait to do it again next week. College football is here. Love this, man. Yeah, I love this. Love talking college ball. Um, hey, en- enjoy these Saturdays because they come they come and go quick. But a lot of matchups this weekend to be excited about. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Yes, sir. Go dogs. Go dogs.